If you are watching this video, I assume you are familiar with matrices. Well, what is a matrix? Wikipedia defines it as a rectangular array or table of, well, something. What that something is doesn't matter as much for now as the fact that it is a rectangular or, I might say, regular grid of objects. More specifically, it is a two-dimensional grid of objects. So what happens if I wanted a three-dimensional grid of objects, or a four-dimensional grid, or how about a 23-dimensional grid? In that case, what we have is a tensor. So let's look at some tensors. A 1D tensor is just a vector. We all work with vectors. We know what vectors are. It's a one-dimensional tensor. If we move to 2D, or two dimensions, then we have a matrix. Once we move to 3D, then we are stuck with just the generic name tensor. But note that this tensor is regular, i.e. all of its vectors in a, in a particular dimension are the same or the same length. That's what I mean by regular. Now, this specific tensor has all dimensions the same size, 3 to be exact, in both the first, second, and the third dimensions. And by the way, I won't ever show anything more than a three-dimensional tensor because I don't know how to draw it on the screen, at least not what nicely. But anyways, not all the dimensions have to be the same like they are on this tensor. You can have tensors with different sizes in each dimension. So just like you can have a, a 5 by 3 matrix or some other values where the number of rows is different than the number of columns. In a tensor, each dimension can have its own length so long as it fills out a grid as shown in these pictures. So we have a tensor. Why do we care? In another video, I'll show how tensors are very helpful when trying to compute complex derivatives. But, we, but before we go there, we have to talk about a basic operation that occurs with tensors, which is the tensor contraction. To understand tensor contraction, we first have to go back and review something you should have seen before, which is the dot product. So please humor me as we review what a dot product is. A dot product has two vectors as an input and generates a scalar as an output. How does it do this? Take these two vectors as an example. Each element in the first vector is paired with a corresponding element in the second vector. These two elements, something from the first vector and something from the second vector, are multiplied together, and then all of these products are added together. This leads to a single scalar output, as shown. Now, this dot product is not limited to three vectors. You can take any length vector, in this case, each vector is length 4, and multiply the corresponding elements together and sum them up. For this to work, the two vectors must be the same length. And rather than writing out every individual element of each vector, we can use a summation notation to describe what the dot product is. In this case, I use p as an index, and this shows that we take the sum of all the corresponding products. Now that we've defined a dot product, why do we care about them? Well, let's look at these two matrices. Let's say I want to compute the product of these two matrices. Well, I can only do that if the number of columns in the first matrix is the same as the number of rows in the second matrix. In that case, I can create a product matrix from these two inputs. And how do I compute the elements in the product matrix? I take the corresponding row from the first matrix, the corresponding column from the second matrix, and I dot product those two vectors together. The output of that dot product is stored as an element in the output matrix. And I can go ahead and fill in every element of the product matrix using this procedure. Take an element in the product matrix, find the corresponding row in the first matrix, the corresponding column in the second matrix, and dot product the two together, and that forms the output matrix. Now note that the restriction that a dot product has to have two vectors are the same length is also the reason why the number of columns in the first matrix and the number of rows in the second matrix have to be the same length, so you can do the dot product. If I wanted to write the matrix product in a different notation or a different way, I could say I'm forming a product matrix, we'll call it C, and write it as a dot product of elements in the other two matrices. And I can rewrite this using the summation notation, using the elements or using the indices of the product matrix to describe which elements, together with the dot product iterator, to multiply together and sum up. So the summation notation shown here defines the output matrix directly. But let's say I don't like writing out the summation notation because I'm lazy, and I don't like writing that sigma. Instead, we can use something known as Einstein notation. In essence, you describe what the output tensor is by the indices that you put on it. So in this example, you can see that the output tensor, remember that a matrix is just a two-dimensional tensor, will be two-dimensional. The output tensor is two-dimensional as it has two indices. Furthermore, one of its dimensions will be the same size as one of the dimensions of the first tensor, the one denoted by I, 
and the other dimension will be the same as one of the dimensions of the second tensor, in this case the one denoted by j. Then there is also a dimension in both the first and the second input tensors that will have a dot product or contraction done to it to essentially eliminate it. So because it has the same index letter for both inputs, it will be dot producted or reduced away for the output. So here I use the notation p, or later on we might use p and q for the ones that are going to be dot product or contracted away, and i, j, k for the dimensions that are going to stay in the product matrix. So we've shown how to do, we've shown how dot products will create matrix multiplication. But matrix multiplication is just a subclass of tensor contraction. So how do we perform a tensor contraction? Consider two tensors shown on the screen, one three-dimensional, that is three by three by three, and a 1D tensor or a vector with three elements. So there are three different ways we could do a tensor contraction in this case. The first is taking the third index and dot producting across the third dimension of the tensor with the vector. You know, the box on the left has just the third index changing inside of that box, while the other two indices are the same within the box. We could, however, also do contraction by dot producting the vector on the right across the second dimension of the 3D tensor. Once again, notice how the indices for the second dimension change in the box on the left, while the first and third index do not change. So this is the second way we can perform tensor contraction. The third way, as you might guess by now, is across the first index of the 3D tensor. All three of these are valid because the 3D tensor is a 3 by 3 by 3 tensor. So how do we know which dimension to perform contraction across? In the index or summation notation, the dimension across which the contraction appears has the index of the dot product as shown. Or, in Einstein notation, there are two indices that are not duplicated, i and j, showing that the output will be a 2D tensor, while the dot product is performed across the first dimension. Note that the index for the first dimension of the 3 by 3 by 3 tensor and the index on the vector is the same, showing which dimensions the dot product will be performed across. Similarly, we can perform contraction across the second dimension by summing up all the elements with the same first and third index after dot producting that vector with 1D tensor on the right. Or we can perform contraction across the third dimension, as shown. In general, though, we cannot perform contraction across any dimension. Consider these two tensors. The tensor on the left is a 2 by 4 by 3 tensor, while the tensor on the right is a 4 by 3 by 3 tensor. Because dot products require vector lengths be the same, only some of the dimensions can be contracted together. Consider the table at the bottom, where we list the three dimensions of A as rows and the three dimensions of B as columns. Each entry in the table represents a contraction possibility corresponding to that dimension of A and B being contracted. Before discussing which dimensions cannot be contracted, note how the Einstein notation in each square denotes which, which elements are being contracted together. Now let us consider row one, or the first dimension of A. Because it has two elements in that dimension, and there are not dimensions with two elements in B, then none of the contractions listed in row one can be performed. Now let's look at the second dimension of A, which has four elements in it. Only the first dimension of B has four elements, so the other two elements of row two cannot be contracted. Similarly, the third dimension of A, having three elements, can only be contracted with two of the dimensions of B. So out of the nine possible contractions, in two 3D tensors, only three can actually be performed with the size of tensors given in this example. Note that tensor contraction can also be extended to do, quote, multidimensional, unquote, dot products. Consider these same two tensors. Note that both A and B have dimensions of length four and three. So I can define a summation that goes across both of these dimensions as shown. In this case, each element in the output is the summation of products across two dimensions of the input tensors. So while before we were taking in two 3D tensors and producing a 4D tensor, notice it's 4D because you have three dimensions plus three dimensions minus the two that get contracted out, so that makes four, right? In this new case, we are taking in two 3D tensors and producing a 2D tensor, so three plus three minus four. As before, we can represent this more succinctly with the Einstein notation. And to be complete, know that there are actually two different 2D tensors we could generate as outputs, depending upon which dimension of length 3 we choose to contract in B. Both of these tensors are expressed in their Einstein notation here. So let's review the important points from this video. First, we defined what this tensor is, which is just a multidimensional regular array of things, a vector and a matrix of tensors, as are three-dimensional and higher objects. Second, using dot products between dimensions, we can define a general operation on tensors, tensor contraction. 
And third, we introduce the Einstein notation to define what dimensions of tensors are being contracted. And if you're wondering why you should care about any of this, well, watch the next video on computing derivatives with tensors. They are a very useful tool.